This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. And we are back with another fabulous episode of Jews You Should Know, and this week we have yet another astoundingly moving conversation. And today's conversation is significant on two fronts, each of which independently could have justified its own podcast or its own reason for conducting an interview. Rabbanit Chana Henkin is a pioneer in the field of women's Jewish education, particularly in the land of Israel. And in my opinion, she has championed this cause with a unique sense of grace without becoming political, and her sincerity and piety practically burst through the airwaves, as you will soon hear. And so we discussed Rabbanit Hankin's life, the family that she married into, the legendary Hankin family for whom the scion was Rabbi Yosef Eliyahu Hankin, the great halachic decisor of early to mid 20th century America, and through her founding of Nishmat and the institution of Yoatzot Halacha, all of which we cover comprehensively in the discussion. But then we also speak about a much more tragic subject, and that is the brutal murder of her son, Harav Eitam Hankin, and daughter-in-law, Nama. They were killed just over seven years ago in a terrible terrorist attack on their way home on Sukkot. And while every murder in the Holy Land is an unspeakable tragedy, in this case, the Jewish world learned about the almost unprecedented qualities of this couple, Rav Eitam Hankin, gained tremendous renown posthumously when people started to understand just how remarkable of a scholar he was at the tender age of 31. He had published in journals across the spectrum of Torah literature, had authored multiple books, was conversant in a fascinating array of topics across genres, And since his passing, his family has taken it upon themselves to print more of his work, which they discovered on his computer following his death. And of course, his wife, Nama, was also a fabulously creative, warm, loving person with great talents, and her loss is no less profound. And so we cover all of this and more in today's conversation. Meanwhile... A reminder, as always, to follow us on social media at Jews You Should Know, spelled out fully on Instagram and Facebook. Jews You Should Know with the letter U on Twitter. Subscribe or follow wherever you may be listening, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform you are listening on now. Please let others know about this podcast. Encourage them to listen and subscribe or follow as well. Comments or questions to Jews You Should Know at gmail.com. And now to our conversation with Nishmat founder and mother of Harav Eitam Hankin, Hashem Imkom Dabav, may his memory be avenged, as well as Naama Rabbanit Chana Hankin. We are here with Rabbanit Chana Hankin, a pioneer in Jewish women's education and uh, a scholar in her own right, and someone as well who has a, a very profound story to share about uh, tragedy in her family and uh, her amazing, amazing son and, and daughter-in-law who passed away a number of years ago, which we'll talk about all of that. But first of all, welcome, Rabbanit Hankin. How are you? Thank you. I'm here in the most wonderful city in the world, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, and I'm good. I'm waiting for the first rain. The clouds outside are heavy, and in other areas of the country, it's begun raining, not yet in Yerushalayim. Those outside of Israel, uh, you know, might not appreciate how sensitive it is to find rain in, in, in the Holy Land. We're recording now, right after the holiday of Sukkot, when uh, we begin at the very end of that holiday, we begin to pray for rain in the land of Israel. We may be release, releasing this a little bit further down the line, so hopefully by then it will have already rained uh, significantly. But in any case, your last name, Hankin, of course, which is really, uh, was your husband's, is your husband's last name. So that is a famous name in the Jewish world, and although many of our listeners may not be familiar with it, so I want you to talk a little bit about it and the history of the family, but I also want to hear a little bit about your side and where your family comes from. So give us a little bit of color, both on who the Hankin family was and is, 
as well where your family came from and uh, and what your upbringing was like. Uh, okay. I don't get any credit for the Hankins. I married well, Baruch Hashem. I recall when I became engaged and one of my uncles, Alev Hashalom, heard that I'm engaged to Yehuda Hankin. He said to me, his face shone, and he said, I once rode in a car with Rav Hankin. I won't forget, I have a, 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 an image of this uncle, beloved uncle, who just shone when he said, I was near Rav Hankin. Rav Hankin was the posseg in the United States before Rav Moshe Feinstein. And when Rav Moshe Feinstein's star rose, I suppose that was in the 1950s. So Rav Henkin continued. He lived a long life. He lived into his 90s, and he remained active as a very major post in the United States until the very early 70s. If you spoke to Rabbanim who got smicha in the 40s and the 50s, and even the 60s, they would often tell you, together with my smich, I got Rav Henkin's phone number. Where did their family come from? The family came from Lithuania. And did he himself, did the, the, the Rabbi Henkin, again, your husband's grandfather, did he himself come from Lithuania or was he already yeah, sure. born in America? No, no, not at all, not at all. My husband spoke to his lady in Hebrew. Uh, most people spoke to him in Yiddish. Uh, he learned in Slut. I mean, if you want to hear about Rav Henkin, just in order to place him, he grew up, when I say Rav Henkin, I'm talking about Rav Yosef Eliyahu Henkin, Sechert Tzadik Lebracha. He grew up in a, in, a, in a family which was exceedingly poor. One of the uncles related that, yes, when we were children, we used to sing on Friday night, Basar V'dagim V'chal Matamim, with empty stomachs, but we were very musical. So once he reached bar mitzvah age, there was no framework that he could learn in. I'm not, I'm I'm forgetting the earlier years right now. You want to hear about the earlier years? I'll open up my son's book, Studies in Halakha and Rabbinic History. And the last article is about his great grandfather. So you can get biography there. But when he was around 14 years old, his mother wanted to send him to yeshiva. She wanted to send him to the mirror. So she, uh, I guess, hacked her feather bed. You know, in Russia, when a couple would get married, you had a dowry and and the feather bed, the very warm quilt was something that was extremely important. And that she still had. And in order to pay a wagon driver to take her son to mirror, she either sold or, I don't know what the word is in English. I've had these chutz living in Israel for 50 years in order to be able to pay for a one-way drive in a wagon to Mir. When he got to Mir, he was at that time around 15 years old, maybe a little bit younger, and no one would take him to the Rosh Hashiva because they laughed and they said, you're a child, what are you doing here? So he went to the nearest town by foot to Karolitz. And what do you do? You have no money in your pocket. You have nothing and they're not ready. You're a child. And what do you do? So he walked to Karolitz, went into a shul. And during that year, he learned through Eruvin 40 times, Shabbos and Eruvin 40 times. A gadol, my husband heard this, a gadol once said in my husband's presence, that the last 38 times I understand, but how this child learned through the first two times, learned through Erevin, I will never understand. But he went through Shabbos and Erevin, a couple of other Masechto during that year. At the end of the year, he heard that Rav Yisra Zalman Meltzer was starting Yeshiva in Slutz. So he got to Slutz. And everyone was much older than he was. He was the youngest of the Chavura. And Rav Yisrael Zalman gave him a Bechina. The Bechina and Eruvin was that he asked Rav Henkin, he comes in some ways almost a game, it's fun, he, to see just how far the mind, the genius mind goes. 
Rav Henkin identified all of the Tanaim and all of the Amoraim who were mentioned on every daf and what every Tosfot said on, on the daf. By the end of the Bechina, Rabbi Sir Salman said, this child knows Eruvin better than I do. He was in Slutz for six years before uh, he got smicha, married, got smicha, or got smicha married, I don't know which, and then was in Rabbanus in Russia, but the government wouldn't give him a permit to stay in one place more than a year. So the family wandered from one place to another. They ended up in Georgia. But even there, it was one year here, one year there, one year at the next place, until um, distant relatives brought him to the United States when the government tried to draft him into the army. The Jewish community insisted that the local priest should be drafted also into the army. And that, thank God, was the saving grace. But at that point, they fled Russia and came to the United States. So the family language is halakha. That's the spoken language in the family. My husband, just fast forward, because you asked about the Henke family. My husband, Rev. Yehuda Henkin, was in Columbia University. He was at that time doing a master's in something at Columbia. One day to the next, he said to himself, you know, my Zaydi is not going to be alive forever. And abruptly, literally from one day to the next, he left Columbia and he had the privilege of learning with his grandfather for five years, several hours in the morning and several hours in the afternoon. At night, he sat in the RJJ base midrash and uh, learned by himself. I know about that because when a relationship developed between us, we would speak about on the phone, but I would have to wait up until he got home. He had the apartment next to his Zadie. The family owned an apartment in one of the co-ops next to Rav Henkin, and some member of the family would always live there in order to care for Rav Henkin. And I would generally need to wait up until one in the morning or so until I could get a phone call. And that gives you a little bit of a picture, particularly the combination of going to Columbia University. He eventually got a degree because uh, he had an uncle who was a university professor at Columbia. University professor means you can teach in any, any department that you wish. So his uncle made it possible for him to get an extension. And before we moved to Israel, shortly after we were married, he was able to finish at Columbia. Uh, we lived in Israel. My husband passed away a year and a half ago, almost two years now. But by the time he passed away, we had lived in Israel for almost 50 years. I grew up Incredible. in Spring Valley, New York. Oh, wow. You're uh, Muncie. You're a Muncie girl. <laughs> you know what? Uh, when I lived in Spring Valley, Muncie was based Medrash Elyon. It was a right. lot, not farmlands. I, I don't think that anyone who lives in Racklin County today would appreciate what I'm saying, but Spring Valley was called Spring Valley because most people had a spring in their basement. We had a wonderful, wonderful community, and the center of gravity was not Muncie, it was Spring Valley. Muncie was a little a little community built around base Medrashelian, and the rest is, of course, history. And what was your childhood like, and who were your early, I guess, influences, especially from a Jewish perspective? Um, I grew up in a wonderful community, a community in the 1950s of the kind that doesn't exist today. When I think to myself of the interesting characters who davened in our shul, we were all one community. And we were in a very large community, but the community was very much, was the center of the life of the people who were members of the community. A small shul, a very close-knit community, very strong Lithuanian influence. The Rav of the community had lost his entire family, both the Rav and the Rebetzin, in Europe. He fled Europe with the Mary Yeshiva. So you had a community that reached all the way from a Yiddish-speaking rabbi, who very much he and others brought the flavor of Lithuania to the community. Together with, there were some people who 
I don't know the extent to which they were Shomer Shabbos, but they were also part of the community. It was, it was a 1950s kind of community, something very, very wonderful. I don't think there was anyone who was major Mahal Shabbos, but I, there were people at, at the fringes who I don't think sent their children to yeshiva. It was really the first generation in which people sent their sons away to yeshiva. And there were young women in the community who were maybe 10 years older than me who didn't get a yeshiva education. Very, very from, but there was nothing, there was nothing for them and they went to public school. So it's a piece of American Jewish history, a very precious piece of American Jewish history. And who were the influences? I mean, listen, I learned to read uh, Hebrew before I learned to read English. I was born after my mother had had miscarriages. I had two older siblings, and my parents did not expect that there would be another successful pregnancy. And, you know, when you have a situation like that, the young child is often a kind of a toy. So what do you do with a toy? You teach her to read Hebrew very young, before I got to kindergarten. So we started kindergarten at age five. I was reading in Hebrew before I was reading in English. Um, My brothers went off to yeshiva and they were very strong influences. But my parents had very, very clear black and white values. As a childhood memory, I remember my father saying, you have to vote for Stevenson. That, that must be 52. Uh, he's good for the Jews. I don't know how old I was, but I remember my father saying that to someone. You've got to vote for Stevenson. Jews. It'll be good for Israel. The values were very, very, very clear. The Torah values were very clear. After my father's death, I learned that he had wanted around 1950 to pick up and to go to Israel. And he was going to do what his father had done before him. You know, you leave Europe, you come to the United States, and you establish a parnassah for yourself, and then you send your family. So he was going to follow that model. And I don't think my mother, Sichon al wanted to divide the family. But it was very moving for me to learn about that years later. And I gathered that they just the values were very, very, very clear. Other than that, I had the typical upbringing of someone who grew up in the 50s, 60s. Did you have a strong Jewish education for the time? Or what was the state of women's education in that period? Um, I went to Central very different place. Any place that I was is very different from what it is today. Afterwards, I went to Stern. But you have to realize that I was reading Hebrew and I was speaking Hebrew fluently when I was in elementary school. I think that was a little different from some people, not from all, but from some people. I had a wonderful, wonderful teacher in the fifth grade. Much of my education didn't match that fifth grade teacher, Rabbi Nachum Michelle. But I think my brothers were a very strong influence on me. My old brother learned in Nair Israel. My parents first sent him when he was by Mitzvah away to Tells, and that was just I don't know how, how many hours he was on a train in order to get to Tells from Spring Valley door. It was way, way too far away and you know, this was the time in which you would come home, not for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but you'd be home for Sukkot, and then you would be home for Pesach. That's a lot for a 13-year-old. So eventually they brought him back. He was very unhappy there. He was in Tower of Adas for a little while, and then he was in Neri And I recall as a child the stars in his eyes when he would come home, and he would tell stories, some of which were very funny. I could Bill tell a story about the mashgiach on Purim and how someone ran down the hall and the mashgiach was there and this, this bachar was drunk and he picked up the mashgiach and who was a short man. He picked him up and he moved him and then he continued. <laughs> and those stories were, I think, formative for me. Father was also a formative influence. My mother was very interesting, a very different story. 
She had no education whatsoever. I was born when she was the last minute. I think she was around 43 when I was born. And wow. there were unsuccessful pregnancies before me. And that's what I mentioned. When I my brothers were teaching me, a four-year-old, to read Hebrew. And, you know, four-year-olds can learn very quickly, very, very quickly can pick it up. My mother then said, if my four-year-old could do it, I can do it. And up until that point, my mother, to whom religion was central in her life, had read transliterated davening in English. She had read in English letters. She learned how to read. And from the moment she read, for the rest of her life, she would stand at the table in the morning. It took her about 45 minutes to get through Shimon Esrei. You know, I was a kid, and the way you do it is Hashem Sfatai Tiftah, Jose Shalom Bimromav, and you're finished. And my mother would not give herself any, in Hebrew we say hakalot. She would insist on davening all of Shimon Esrei, and she relished that. And as an adult now, when I became an adult, I marveled at her ability over the course of years to spend 45 minutes a day on Shimon Esrei. So I guess that's a little something about my upbringing. So when did you decide, first of all, that you wanted to uh, move to Israel? And did that correspond to your choice to get into women's education? And how did that come about? When I was in the fifth grade, I decided to stop saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I went to my teacher and with the uh, Mrs. Freed, and I told her I can't say the Pledge of Allegiance because if America and Israel, you know, in the primitive sense of the fifth grader thinks, if America and Israel were ever in a war, I wouldn't be on America's side. So a pledge is a serious thing. The original thing. Uh, dual loyalty <laughs> charge. Yeah, I said I can't do it. It took me a little longer to stop singing the Star Spangled Banner. So the answer is very, very early on. I mean, I just couldn't figure out how you could say with Techazena and Enu when you could get on a boat and get to Israel. Planes were a little bit less common at that time. But it just didn't make sense to me. And years before we made Aliyah, it was clear to me and separately to my husband, Ronoli Bracha, that we were going to make Aliyah. What did you intend to do when when you got here? What were your, did you have plans or was it kind of just a whimsical uh, dream? I didn't get involved in women's education for a while after I came to Israel. The story of women's education, I'll tell you in a minute, but uh, my husband got smicha from his grandfather, amongst others, when he was in uh, the United States. And we were going to do in Israel exactly what we would have done had we stayed in the United States, if we would have stayed in the United States. So we would have moved to some community, someplace, and we would have been the Rav of a community and built up the community and done what a Rav does in the community. And I would have been a very happy uh, Rabbi's wife in a community somewhere. So coming to Israel, we had exactly the same expectations for the first decade we lived in Israel, we lived in Beit Sha'an, which was a development town. Today, we no longer call it a development town, but it was a development town in Israel's like northeast. I guess that's how you would describe it. We were the Ashkenazim in town. My husband became rather quickly the area rav, and we, we moved very quickly into an Israeli maslul, an Israeli way of life. Beit was a formative period for me. I was teaching in the high school. I was teaching Torah Shabal Peh in the high school, and they made me a deal that uh, they would give me Torah Shabal Peh to teach in the high school if I also taught English. I told them I'm not an English teacher. I know how to speak English, but I don't know how to teach English. And they said, yeah, but you know more than anyone else in the town. 
there are no other native English speakers. So I taught English, I guess, for a year or two, but basically I, it was Limude Kodesh that I was teaching in the high school. I'm not going into details of the next story, but this is a story that ultimately led to what I'm doing today. First time I needed to go to Mikveh in Beit Sha'an, it came on a Friday night. And I knew where the mikvah was because we had gone to Tovel our dishes at the mikvah. So I knew there was a mikvah. I knew, I knew where it was. And and then and I get there on Friday night and the mikvah is closed. The place is dark. It's Choshech Mitzrayim. And I say to myself, wait, I, I'm on the right street. We're a small town. There's a mikvah here. Where is it? And I feel for the door and it's locked. I thought to myself, well, this is a new frontier in modesty that you can't even find the building. But um, I discovered afterwards, I solved my problem the way I needed to solve my problem. But I said to myself, there's something here in the town that needs to be dealt with. My husband wasn't rabbi in town. He was rabbi in the area, a regional rabbi. I was told that the mikvah lady asks women to go to the mikvah on Friday afternoon rather than Friday night because she wants to be home with her family. And I said, how long has this been going on? And it had been going on for quite a while. And nobody was doing anything about it. And how do you let that happen? So I went to the Moetza Dati. My husband was a member of Moetza Dati. So I had protection there. I went and I said, listen, you are firing this woman and I'm going to hire someone else. And until we hire someone else, I'm taking over the mikvah. And they said, we can't fire her. Uh, it's against the law. And I said, okay, so reassign her to deliver tea in the Moitza Dati. That was once in Israel, a profession. You were the cleaning lady and you delivered tea. You brought cups of tea before electric teapots to all of the workers. In any event, I got the mikvah up from six to 26 women a night over the course of working nonstop for a couple of years on that. and. For me, that was formative. I hadn't expected to do that, but for the wife of a rabbi, you see a situation, nobody is doing anything about it. So you say, I've got to do something about it. And it taught me that you can make a difference. There's another side to my life. I do love learning Torah. When I was in Bern College, they decided to give the Mara to women. This is before they formally established the Mara. And we were a class of around 90, 88 went to a, a lighter course and two of us went to a Gemara Shior. And to me, it just made sense because if I was studying other subjects in college, which didn't mean much to me, I wanted to get at the heart of what did mean much to me. And from there, I got my beginnings. And after continued in our own home after I was married. So the love of learning had always been there. When we came to Yerushalayim, eventually, I, I started giving shirim in my neighborhood. And Nishmat, the institution that I'm at the head of, grew out of that grew out of the sense that there shouldn't be a disparity between a high level of secular learning and a low level of Torah learning, because religion sort of moves away from the epicenter of your life, if that's the case. So that's from there Nishmat started, but about eight years after Nishmat started as a center for women's learning, with a very, very strong emphasis on halacha, upon not just learning out of a love of learning, but learning. We had a very strong Balchuva population at that point. And these are people whose lives were profoundly affected, changed. People who came to us with a very high degree of secular learning and having Torah learning on par, on intellectual par. You know, when you come from a place like Princeton or Harvard, was very meaningful. What was the state of 
Jewish women's education at the time when you started? Were you the kind of the only show in town, so to speak? Were there other alternatives for people? Well, there were the people who came to me and asked me to start a school for them. I told them, no way, we're in Yerushalayim. You have plenty of alternatives. I'm a mother of young children. This is not what I need in my life. And you don't need it. You'll find someplace else. And they went through the alternatives. They were looking for a combination of very strong emphasis upon learning the intellect, but they wanted it to come along with the religious package, which they felt was less present in the one or two other places that were available to them. I mean, that's other places had, had, had liberalized not only in terms of their orientation towards learning, but likewise, that came along with a sort of a a laxity in halachic observance, perhaps. And they wanted... No, I wouldn't call it a laxity. I would call it a lack of emphasis. I would not call it a laxity. The question is what you emphasize. Achas v'chalila, I don't want to derogate anyone and anything, but for us, as I said, there was a religious package, and I think that was something which was not available. It was something which was very new, very, very new. Around eight years into the school, that's when my two loves came together, my love of learning, together with the commitment to Tarat HaMishpacha and started somewhat serendipitously. I mean, I I remember after decades of educating women in Tarat Mishpacha saying to my husband, you know, I'm seeing the same thing going wrong everywhere. Women are not going to Rabbanim to ask questions. What happened one morning was I went out in my neighborhood on my way to Nishmat. I don't even remember what I was supposed to do that day. My day changed. But I saw a friend across the street. I crossed the street. I asked her how she was. And she started sobbing. And she mm. said, I went to the mikvah last night. And this morning, I have a problem again. We're not living a normal life. It's been this way for months now. And I said to myself, you know, what this woman experiencing, and she had told no one. She had sent her husband to a posek who lived in their building with specific questions, and the posek answered the questions, an outstanding posek. He answered the question that he was asked. He was asked, is this okay? Is this not okay? And so he answered what he was asked. But the bigger question is, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And What's the medical piece of this? And how can you connect the dots and make people's lives better? And that was when I came home and I said to my husband, this is it. We've got to do something about this. He was 100% behind me. I spoke to a couple of rabbanim and a couple of doctors. My day that day, you know, it started, I guess, at around eight in the morning as usual, but it ended around uh, one thirty in the morning in the home of a certain posek. By the end of the day, I had a group of people who were behind me, principally my husband, but a group of rabbanim and a group of doctors who were ready to start out together with me to train women to be an address for questions, a first address for questions of other women. I mean, today, around the world, we must have around 100, I don't remember the numbers, but it's over 160 Yawatzon Halacha in Israel, in the United States, in Canada, in England. Right now, my colleague, Atara Ice, is in Australia because women there want to start a program for them. We've gotten over 400,000 questions over the course of the years. We have an open telephone line and internet sites in four languages. My husband, up to the night before he was Nifter, was uh, one of two posts came on call to the Yoatzon Halacha. He reviewed every question. 
that was answered in writing before it could go out. We also have a doctor uh, who reviews every question before the answer goes out. A doctor who's also a yo etzad halacha. It's a remarkable, you know, sometimes there's hashgacha. You're very lucky that there's a bracha from above to something that you do. And in this case, the bracha has been tremendous. What kind of opposition did you encounter, especially early on, doing something a little bit less traditional? And how did you deal with that? Was was that difficult for you? Everybody asks me that question with the assumption that what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell them the story of cowboys and Indians. You know, you could, the good guys and the bad guys. And then I'm going to tell you that with the good guys and the bad guys and the rap bunny who posted, there was no opposition. I'm not a flag waver. That's not me. We did our work quietly. One time I sat with, here, I'll tell you the story. There's a Sefer which was published. We're now working on the second volume. There was a Sefer of Chuvot of Yoatzot Halacha. Responsible. Yeah. Yeah, called Nishmat Habayit. The first volume was published. We're now working on the second volume. It's a short question, a short answer, and a lengthy halachic exposition. And the amazing thing about that is if you look at the Haskamot, there are really good Haskamot on that Sefer. We went to a certain Posek. Now, I'm not going to be at all specific so you're not going to figure out whom I'm speaking about. But we went to a posse who is a Haredi posse who is revered and respected in very, very broad circles. We went here for what I call a bracha. I didn't use the word haskama. I went together with Rav Yaakov Verhaftig. And with one of the Yoatzot Halacha, whose father is very close to this Jose, and Rav Yaakov Varhaftig began speaking to him, you know, sort of casually. And I lost my patience after a little while. And I said, can we speak about Yoatzot Halacha? And he said, I'll give you this in English. But we were speaking in Hebrew, of course. He, he said, no. And... <laughs> You know, I kind of stuttered a little, and I said, perhaps it would be possible for me to tell the Rav about this manuscript that we brought, perhaps the Rav, no, no. And then he said, have you heard? You've heard very quickly. I've refused to discuss this. And so a little bit sadly, I said, "Uh, yeah, I guess we have heard. So he said, well, that's for the record. Now I'm going to tell you you're doing Melechet Kodesh. Uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu should give you strength to go, Michael, Michael, don't ever falter, keep doing what you're doing. But if you dare to quote me, I will deny it. So quoting without his name. Very honestly, there was not opposition because this wasn't a gender issue for us. It wasn't a gender issue. It was an issue of two things. One of them had to do with Women are not asking enough questions. Their lives and the lives of couples are much more difficult than they need to be. You have to make a tikkun when people are suffering. And this wasn't about gender. Why wasn't it about gender? People sometimes say to me, wow, you are so smart. You figured out how to manipulate the rabbinim. And I tell them, what in the world are you talking about? I share the values with the Rabbani. I mean, everyone is wherever they are on the spectrum. But the Rabbani share with me. I don't, I don't want to speak about the Rabbani as if you have one group of Rabbani within Jewish life. But I want to say Rabbani share with me the two points of the program. One point of the program is that You've got to have people observe halacha properly. And it's not a service if people don't know the halacha. 
I mean, just imagine to yourself, there's a system you know nothing whatsoever about, Ashford. You're a 20-year-old, 22-year-old, 24-year-old, and suddenly the system descends upon you, and you're the one who has total responsibility for this. And mistakes are always people are make heal when they shouldn't be make heal. They're machmir. And more times they're machmir when they shouldn't be machmir, when they don't have to be machmir. And there's halacha and there's also personal suffering of people. And if people are suffering, it's 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 not a kiddush Hashem. You don't want that. You can't let people suffer. So much suffering that could be avoided. I don't think there's a difference of opinion between ourselves and Rabbanim. Where you'll find the difference of opinion is the education of Yoatzon Halacha. In order to answer questions, the education is Gemara and it's Shulchan Aruch, Tor Be Yosef, Bach, Torah Hashlamim, Shulchan Aruch Shach Vatad. So of course, there this is where there's a disagreement. There are those who say this is wonderful, and there are those who say, no, this is not what we believe should be done. But once you discover, you see it, you know, it's in halacha, you're exposed to her. I mean, that's what happened in the United States. And until people saw you know, it's in halacha, they didn't realize the extent to which these women were absolutely meticulously committed to halacha and committed to making <clears throat> people's lives better. So we ended up with good haskamot on Nishmat Habayit. And what I want to say is that the book was just translated into English. It just appeared. It's Nishmat Habayit in English. It is marvelous. And I'm trying now to promote this in different circles and to tell people, listen, when a couple gets engaged, buy this book as a present. It, you know, it, it, you're an English speaker. It's so accessible. I also have to say, I mean, you're doing Kirov. You're on a campus. You know that there are women who are getting very high educations. And even if someone is not going to read the book from cover to cover, Two women will sit down and have a chavruta in it. They'll learn it. It makes it easier to perform a very difficult mitzvah, a challenging mitzvah. It makes it much, much easier. If you are in an environment which is intellectually stimulating, you can take the safer. A couple can learn together. And I think it makes the situation much more handleable to a couple. It's not a book for a couple to make decisions from themselves, but it's a safer which a couple can open and they can see, oh, this question is similar to something which I've encountered. Apparently, it's worth it for me to ask a question. Are you ever frustrated that that your efforts could be conflated with other efforts that might be more gender-driven or agenda-driven, perhaps, and that they can kind of get lumped together in the public perception or in terms of criticism that's leveled? Listen, by nature, I'm not someone who lives a frustrated life. I don't believe in being frustrated. You're never going to be criticized if you do nothing, um, except I don't think that's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu put us in this world. A rabbi in Australia was in touch with me uh, a couple of years ago, and he told me, I heard about Yoatzot Halacha. I heard about your Yoatzot Halacha. And I realized it was my responsibility to get up in Shul on Shabbos and to condemn you and to tell the women in the community why they shouldn't go near a Yoatzot Halacha, why this is inappropriate. He said, but I felt I should learn a little bit more about you, you know, in order to do a good job. So he said, I went into your website and I was floored. It was phenomenal. And I got up in shul and I told the women of my congregation, all of you need to know about this website. You should go into the website. You should use it. You know, yes, he was viewing this initially as this is women who are looking to make a change and a gender change. 
You know, I don't want to be too tamim. I don't want to say that there are no sociological implications to what I'm doing. But we live in a world which changes. And I believe firmly that the more Torah that's learned, the better. And you try to give over to the best of your ability, Yerat Shamayim, together with Torah. You try to make it into a package and you hope for the best. And there's no institution anywhere in Jewish life, including uh, Velazhin. You know how many of the secular poets, Bialik, uh, had his beginnings in Velazhin and he wasn't alone. For that reason, you're going to close down Velazhin. You're going to hope that you're able to have enough Talmudim who are going to give over to the next generation what the yeshiva is really about. The fact that some people can confuse this, you know, what are you going to do? Some people can confuse anything. You just have to go and do. And I go back to my early days. A lot more women were using the mikveh as a result of the fact that I exploded. So it happened more than once in my life that I said, somebody's got to get up and do something. And, you know, an important person isn't doing anything. So let a less important person get up and do something. Switching gears, we just passed the seventh yard site, the seventh anniversary of a day that was very tragic, of course, for your family and really for all of Am Yisrael, for the Jewish people. And that is the the terrorists uh, killing of your son and daughter-in-law, Rabbi Eitam Hankin and Nama, Hashem Yimkum Dabav, God should avenge their souls. And what came out afterwards was an extraordinary exploration of extraordinary people. And I would love if you could speak a little bit about, first of all, that experience initially for your family, for yourself. And then, of course, we'll talk about what that has generated and sort of precipitated uh, in a really unprecedented way. Um, well, you can probably imagine this is not very simple for me to discuss. The commander of Sahel, the Israel army in the region, sat with us many times in our home, we developed a close relationship. He felt very guilty that they hadn't uncovered the terrorist cell before the terrorists murdered our children. And I told him, you know, it's miraculous you've uncovered as much as you have, and you've all risked your lives day by day in order to protect us. In our case, it didn't work. There was a terrorist cell of a total of about 15 people who were planning a quality terror attack. The planning, if you read through the court testimonies, you see the planning was for about a year. Our son and daughter-in-law and their four children were on their way back. We had spent the first part of the day with them, and then they went group of friends were getting together in someone's sukkah. We have a picture of the men sitting in the sukkah that night. And they had these wonderful inflatable jumping toys for the kids. There's a whole bunch of young families got together. And it was around nine in the evening. And our son and daughter-in-law left, hoping to make it back to Neria, where they lived in order to attend the Simchat Beit HaShoeva there, and their car was ambushed. There were three people in a car. We don't know at what point our daughter-in-law was wounded. Our son was already severely wounded by the drive-by shooting. He managed to get the car safely to the side of the road. At the end of Shiva, we went up there and we saw the skid marks When the terrorists saw that the car had stopped, they circled back. One was holding a submachine gun, one was holding a uh, revolver, and the submachine gun was at my daughter-in-law's side of the car. 
the children were in back, the four children. The one with the revolver was at my son's side. Apparently they were planning to kidnap them. They came together with Azikim, I guess, handcuffs with the equipment. And my son, with the remainder of his strength, he was struggled physically with, you know, with no arms, with bare arms. He struggled with the gunman next to him to wrestle the gun away from him. At that point, my son was apparently from what the forensic information, he was bleeding to death, bleeding from his chest. But he managed to get the gun out of the hands of the gunman. When the other guy next to my daughter-in-law saw that, he shot with submachine gun. He unleashed a volley of bullets. Fortunately, not just did he murder my son, but fortunately, he injured his fellow and the guy must have screamed out in Arabic. And at that point, from point blank range, he shot our daughter in law, someone who was young and beautiful and very thin. You couldn't imagine her fighting physically with anyone. He shot her with a sub machine gun, finished off my son, my daughter in law. And then they fled. They were apprehended. The, the whole cell was apprehended. And the children were not harmed, despite the valley of bullets that peppered the car. Um, excuse me, I have to make a bracha. That's the first thunder and lightning. Forgive oh. me. I'm not going to back with you. The car was peppered by holes. I didn't see the car. My children did. And it was like a sieve. And somehow the four children, Baruch Hashem, were unscathed. There's a... Wow, do you hear that? I could hear it, yeah. You were able to hear that? There's a... I wouldn't call it a marathon, but what do you call it? A, a run uh, tomorrow morning from one yeshuv to another yeshuv along the road that our children were traveling when they were ambushed. And my grandchildren will be running. And it's a yeshiva, which is sponsoring a yeshiva that my son had attended as a, when he was in high school does this run every year and from Itamar to Elon More and they stop and they have ceremony at the place of the murder where now there's a huge uh, there's monument there that the Shiva put up. It's a pirate monument, but it's a monument there. And the road has been renamed Derech Eitan. Eitan meaning steadfast, but Eitan also being an abbreviation of Eitan Venama, Harav Eitan Venama, Derech Eitan. So the kids and one of my sons in law, quite a number of grandchildren, will be running this marathon, running this marathon tomorrow morning, which is a way of saying, you know, we're not abandoning this country, this is our country. And we're going to lead our lives, productive lives, good lives in this country. Uh, thank God the kids are well, they're thriving, they're growing. You know, the tremendous pain is that the sweeter and the uh, more gifted the children are, you wish that the parents could have five minutes. What would my daughter-in-law not give for five minutes with her youngest child, who is as sweet as sugar? He's now almost eight years old. He was then nine months old. So he's now just give us till the end of Kislev and he'll be eight years old. He was then nine months old. Their oldest son is a big boy. He's 16 years old. He should be learning the Chavruta with his father. And his father should have had the pleasure, the privilege of 
learning with him. You know, we live in Israel. We're not the first. We're part of a link. We're part of a story of the reestablishment of Jewish life in our country. And we're not the first casual beat. We always say this in Israel. In Yitz Hashem, we should be the last casualties. Amen. Tell me a little bit about your son, Rav Eitan, because he was an extraordinary intellect. He passed away. He was 31 years old, and his output of you know, halachic literature and other essays and across such a wide range of genres was just extraordinary. And then what you discovered afterwards, I believe, on his computer was even more extraordinary. And, and I know that you've published some of that already. Tell me a little bit about, about him and, and who he was and, and what he was like. First, I'll tell you the story of the book. At the end of Shiva, both of our families, my daughter-in-law's parents and we, went to the couple's home to end Shiva together in their home. Up until then, we had sat Shiva in our own home, and then we went to the couple's home. At the end of Shiva, my youngest daughter took my son's computer with her to her home. I didn't have the presence of mind to think about anything, but she took the computer. She and her husband tried to turn on the computer, and it was locked. And they said, well, there's got to be a code, but what's the code? Where's the, How are we going to find out the code? So she called up her older brother and she said to him, you have any idea of what the code to the computer could be? And the two of them together thought that it must be, I can't tell you the numbers, the code, because the other person who was part of this teenage prank still uses that code. Okay. Everything. <laughs> what it was is these, Two high school boys scaled the tallest building in our neighborhood, a water tower, and they hung a sheet at the top of this water tower, which towered over every single building in our neighborhood, over all the apartment buildings. They hung a sheet with the gematria of their names. And my daughter and my son together said, it's got to be that gematria. And they were right. They opened the computer and they were stunned. And they were in touch with us. My daughter was in touch with us immediately. And we started looking over the material that was there, and we were stunned. My son was very orderly. And no one could figure out how he managed as much as he managed in 31 years. First Sefer was published a couple of years before he got smicha. I mean, he started publishing when he was 20 years old. The publication where he published uh, sent him the proofs of the article to go over, and he saw he was listed as Rabbi Tam Henkid, and he called him up and said, listen, I'm not a Rav. And they said to him, we don't have a choice. If we don't write Rav, the public is going to think that we're being disrespectful to you because no one is going to believe that a season." Tamit Chacham hasn't written this. The fount of creativity on the part of both members of the couple was remarkable. Our son published several Sfarim in Halakha during his lifetime. We've been publishing more since his death. Right now, there's a book that's appeared in English. It's a must read. It's called Studies in Halakha and Rabbinic History by Rabbi Eitam Henkin published by Magid, and people who have read it call me up and they say, we don't get it. How did the same scholar write about the kosher status of strawberries or absorbance and emission in modern day utensils or a demarcation of the Shabbos prohibition concerning electronic doors and other sensors and at the same time write about the period of the Gemara, the Musar Yeshiva and the Barduk, our Hashulchan and the afflictions of the censors, zealotry versus tolerance in the old Yeshuv, the Shrita controversy, Rav Kook, Rav Huttner, this one, that one. What's the relationship between them all? One of the reviewers wrote, I opened up the book and I thought it was a fetch shrift, a volume in which they assembled top-notch scholars for each one to write a masterpiece 
And then I discovered it's the same person who wrote all of these masterpieces. And, you know, what's his field? No one has figured out how he managed to do as much as he did. He had a conversation with a friend, and I heard this from the friend. The friend asked him, how do you manage to do so much? And he said, I'll tell you what my key is. I'm organized. Stay there. I have files on my computer, and whenever I find something interesting, I go and I put it in the right file, and then I decide what I'm going to write about. You know, he was a 20-year-old when he got married. Baruch Hashem, they married very, very young. He was sitting in a kolil and learning, but he was also supporting his family. My daughter-in-law was supporting the family as well. When he was around 23 years old, he told us who he was going to do his doctorate under. And we said, oh, so you're going to go to college. Um, we hadn't known that. We had known that he was sitting in a kolil and he was learning and he was writing and he was publishing. And he was also working in order to support the family. And at this time, there was this extraordinary amount of creativity that was going on. He wanted someone to look over an article he had written. And someone said, why don't you send it to Professor David Asaf? So he sent it to Professor Asaf. And Professor Asaf told us, we met him during the Shiva. And he said to us, I was floored. Avrech Meshi, sitting, I, I don't even know how to say this in, in English, but he's sitting in a kolel somewhere. And he's writing like a seasoned scholar. He has no academic training whatsoever. I have no idea whether he matriculated high school. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's not where the emphasis was in our family. He was a spirited kid. He was a spirited kid. And that, that prank wasn't his only prank. But he was also sitting. We have a good library at home. And he was also sitting and devouring, and he had retentive memory, an unusually retentive memory. My husband said there are brilliant people who are able to see the fine details, and there are other brilliant people who are able to see the big picture. Very rarely do you find someone who's able to do both. And I think that's the case with our son, that if you start reading the book, someone said to me, your son makes the most boring subjects riveting. I could put down the book. <laughs> so I disagree with her about whether the subjects are boring. But and he married, is, like you said, traditional yeshiva style learning with academic studies, which are normally kind of two separate domains. Listen, and he was able to I don't know whether them. I would call it traditional yeshiva style learning. I would say Henkin learning. Um <laughs> He was a Hankin. I get no credit. He was an autodidact, the son of an autodidact who ended up learning with his Zaidi. But, but before that, my husband had done a lot of learning on his own. And our son was the same thing. There were periods in which he was invited, I guess, as a seventh or eighth grader to miss <laughs> a couple of weeks of school here and there. And I would see him curled up in bed with the Encyclopedia Talmudit, which he was reading. So he devoured, but he didn't just devour. He devoured, he retained, he organized, and he saw the large picture. I think what makes his books, including the book he wrote on the Aruch HaShulchan, which is a history of the Aruch HaShulchan, but it's a history written by a Talmud Chacham, absolutely honest. In other words, there was this wasn't um wasn't well, hagiography. Uh, it wasn't yeah, hagiographic, it. not at all, not at all. He had a tremendous well, he had a sense of truth. And I mean I learned that very early in marriage from my husband. Uh, listen, there's the Henkin family tradition has these razor sharp minds together with absolute honesty and truthfulness. I saw this Mida in my father-in-law, Zikra over the course of the years, we were privileged to have him living near us. And beforehand, absolute truthfulness, honesty, no willingness to in any way 
distort the past in order to conform with your ideology. And I think that's why people find my son's writing so refreshing. His book on Aruch HaShulchan was published in 2,000 copies, and by the end of the first week it was available, it had sold out. And people from all parts of the spectrum, I think that's what's so interesting. You know, it goes from modern Orthodox to high Haredi. I was reading with my grandchildren on uh, the art site itself, which is on Chol Hamoid. We were reading some of his writings and he wrote, I wish I had it in front of me right now. He wrote, I'm happy to have friends in Williamsburg and Borough Park. I wouldn't have even known my son was in touch with these people. I didn't know didn't know my son wrote in Yiddish. I had no idea. He was a very <laughs> humble individual. He didn't share these things. He wrote, I have friends in Maya Sharim. I have friends in Kiryat Moshe. Kiryat Moshe, where we live, is blue and white. I'm not sure I could get them together in a room, but I, he wrote, I'd rather, as the famous adage goes, spin with Avat Yisrael, love of Jews, rather than sinat Yisrael, rather than hatred of people. And he had this ability to communicate with everyone across the spectrum. He published in, I looked again after his death. I wasn't even aware of this during his life. I know he was publishing all over, but I was, I'm busy. I lead a busy life and I very sadly, didn't have time to discuss all of this with him. He published from Beit Aaron Israel, which is Slonim, through Yeshurun, which is, I guess, mainstream Haredi. I'm just giving you a little bit of a taste, all the way to Tchumin, which is Torani, Sioni, to Akdamot, which is modern Orthodox to the Israel Historical Society's Sion, secular flagship Israel Historical Society publication. I don't know the people who did that. Almost nobody has his level of intellect and, and brilliance. That's just not something that people can really emulate. But what do you think, or what would you like people to take away from his life and from Nama's life you know, that people could incorporate, even if they don't have those preternatural, exquisite gifts, but what can people draw from their lives that would relate to the average person? I think we can learn from them to be respectful of everybody, to listen to people, to be honest with people. As a parent, I would say to any parent of teenagers, take your children seriously and don't get too aggravated at their childhood or teenage pranks because one of many teenage pranks opened up to us a treasure chest that we are so gifted with. But to someone who's a Talmud Chacham or a scholar, they could learn to be organized from our son. To those of us who are commoners, my son managed to have very close relationships across the spectrum of orthodoxy. And apparently it's doable. Uh, someone showed me a, an internet forum in Yiddish. I can understand a little. I'm of that generation, but I, I can read a little, understand a little. I can't speak. But I read, it was very moving, the reactions, one of the Chavura. Is one of us. I guess we could all take away from there that if it was done, it's doable. It's doable to be a community together, to be people who respect each other and who are actually friends of each other. If I look at my son's friends, he had probably tens of friends or hundreds who are in touch with each other uh, virtually not in person. He didn't have time for that. He went to shul with people he davened with, but he didn't have what one would call an active social life. He and Nama didn't. They worked They worked very hard and they lived modestly, very modestly. 
and they're parents of four kids, and they were both busy around the clock. But the range of people who were in touch with him, there were academics who were in touch with him. People don't normally talk to each other, don't normally interact with each other. Now, we, first of all, where could people find this book, the current book? And Studies Halakha, in Halakha and Rabbinic History. It's available via Amazon. It's available via the publisher. I mean, just write Rabbi Etam Hankin or Hankin Studies in Halakha, and you'll, you'll get it on Amazon. And the publisher, Magid, sells it. And your local friendly Judaica bookseller presumably has it. We published two books this year. One of them is the translation of articles, some of which had been published during his lifetime, some of which were published after, posthumously by us. But there is also an enlarged edition of his classic, Lachem Yiela Ochla, about bug infestation, which is now in an enlarged edition, and that's available via Mossad Harav Cook in Hebrew, or your local friendly Judaica bookseller who can get it from Mossad Harav Cook for you. Lachem Yiela Ochla. Fabulous. And was there more material on the computer that has not yet been published? Oh, yes. He left me homework for years. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Maybe that was his ultimate lasting prank (laughs) from beyond. (laughs) I pray to Hakal Shparuch that I have years in front of me. We have plans of another Sefer, which I hope will appear by the Athe Art site. And then there are another one or two more. Fabulous. I very much look forward to reading that. And I have not yet gotten my hands on the uh, Halacha and History book, but I am very excited to do so uh, very shortly. So yeah, it looks marvelous. And his whole life was marvelous, as was Namaz. And it should be an everlasting blessing for your family and for the entire Jewish people. Uh, who, could, who could use that blessing, as we know so well. Rabbi Nikhana Hekin, founder of Nishmat and mother of Rav Etam, and again, a, a pioneer in, in education in your own right. Thank you so, so much for joining us. My pleasure. May it be a healthy and good winter for all of the Jewish people and the world. Amen. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, If you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews you should know.